from all the religious leaders of his time and still go forward and still help everyone. If you think about it, Jesus' energy never ever was weak. Even after he spoke with many crowds and he didn't even eat. And his apostles said, we have nothing to eat. Jesus said, do, you, do not labor for the bread which perishes. Even then, he had this great power in him. And if you think, you'll say, well, Bishop Anthony, after all, he's the Son of God. So he brought that power with him. But he was training us in his own life with this great power that any crosses we have, any obstacles, if after we've expended our energy, we can expand the energy by one thing, prayer. Jesus, if you'll notice in the Gospel, after all his big crowd-pleasing events, went to the mountain to pray alone. And only after hours of prayer did he come down from the mountain and walk on water. We can't walk on water before we're on the top of the mountain. Before we're praying, we can't be playing. We can't be walking. We can't be doing anything extraordinary if we don't do the ordinary daily prayers that even Jesus Christ did. The key to carrying the cross is by bearing our love to God in prayer. The reason Jesus had absolute confidence in what he did, even mounting Mount Golgotha with his cross, is because he was in communion with his Father constantly. The bond, and may I say, the nails which fashioned his heart to God the Father were a lot bigger than the nails that fastened his hands to the cross. And the iron that was used in his personal spiritual prayer was so strong that the bands of that grace and love could never, ever be weaker. No human being could put him on the cross. Why did they bend, bound his hands and feet when love would have held him there? If the Father wanted him on the cross to die for our sins and to rise again because that's what the Father wanted, the Son was going to do it. You know, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked his Father if this was the only way he could save mankind. And when he got the answer in the silence of that time, he said, let's be going. And he never looked back. And even when he was weak, they had Siren of Cyrene carry his cross. Jesus didn't look to the people who were whipping him. He didn't look to the soldiers. He just looked straight ahead and he said, let's go. Well, I added that to the gospel. <laughs> but I interpreted it, let's go. Because he knew that he was pleasing his Father. When we get resistance in our life, the only way is we have to earn our rest. We have to earn our rest by going against the tide, by going against the current, by moving upstream. Even though salmon would move upstream, and those big swimmers, the big fish, they would go upstream first to lead everyone else there. And they, you have people watching them and they think, well, how could they ever get up there? Because they had an instinct to go home. Jesus had an inclination to go home. He had a will to go back to his Father. So he swam upstream all the way back into heaven. And the reason is because he loved his Father. When we love someone that much, there's nothing that can keep us away from pleasing them and doing their will. He said, I and the Father are one. I don't do anything without my Father. He was tied to his Father with a great love. We don't know how many eons and ages 
He enjoyed the presence of his Father without any of the creation. We only know what's revealed to us. But we know that there's nothing the Father asked the Son that he wouldn't do. And he may have thought, well, can I do all this like in the Garden of Gethsemane? But he still went ahead and did, did it. So I think we have to act on our faith. We can't act on our analysis. Analysis creates paralysis. If we analyze everything we're supposed to do, well, that might be a good beginning. We don't want to be foolish. But after that, if faith is telling us to go forward, let's fearlessly, fearlessly go forward into the future and never look back. That's the great lesson of Christ. It's not only in his divinity that he was strong. He showed that a human being must be filled with the grace of divinity and go through everything that seems to be impossible. My father used to tell me, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible will take only a little longer. And that's no matter what condition you're in, my brothers and sisters. We have a promise that the cross overcomes everything. And we live in a world today where everybody's trying to find the biggest and broadest and softest, softest and luxurious comfort zone. Comfort zone. We're putting down crosses all the time. We're laying them down. We think we have to go to the place that gives us the least resistance. And we think that that's the place that's going to give us the most comfort. I don't think it works that way. The more that we're challenged, the more our personality expands. The more we realize we can do it. The more we realize we can do it, there's another big obstacle on the way. I think crises are opportunities. A crisis is a step up. If we can pass the test of that uncertain moment, we can get to a higher place and realize that there's no step we can't take. There's a summit we can reach, no matter if we can't see it beside the clouds yet. That's what Jesus is telling us. We have a great strength in us to do it. If you think about this, my brothers and sisters, remember the story of Annie Sullivan and Helen Keller. I don't know, it may be when we grew up, we always knew that. And Sullivan didn't know her purpose in life. She was kind of hampered by different passions. She had a great brilliance and a great God-given energy. But she didn't know what direction to put that energy in. But she had a great talent for people who had special needs. And she got a letter in the mail in a phone call that she had a challenge. There was this girl, Helen Keller, that was blind, that was deaf, that was intransient, that was stubborn, that was willful, but she had potential. And and Sullivan could have said, no, it's too much for me. Especially because she was wrapped up in her own self-absorbed world. But for some reason, she broke out of that at that moment and said, I'll do it. And because she did it and trained that wonderful Helen Keller, who's given us all of her writings and her inspiration over the time that we can even read now, is because she said, I can do it. And what it did was, it focused her, it settled her, it regularized her, it inspired her, it energized her, and it made her personality in the full expression of what God had wanted it, because there was such a challenge and such an obstacle that it couldn't be done, that nobody else wanted it. Maybe we should really think, and all of us should think, if there's a challenge that we really don't want, but it's a really good challenge. It's an objectively good challenge. And for some reason, providentially, we're put in that space. I think we have to think about Jesus. Whoever would save his life will lose it. 
But whoever loses his life, whoever takes a risk to take that challenge, will save it. The reason we will save it is because we will expand it. We will expand it into becoming all it could be. When Jesus died on the cross, they thought he lost. The Roman soldiers thought he was just another dead man. The religious authorities thought their authority wasn't being threatened by a dead man. Hades took a dead man. And as St. John Chrysostom said, Behold, Hades trembled. Hell, hell received the man, and God was there. So sometimes, when we think we've failed, or we haven't done that which we can, and we have everybody telling us we're a failure, we can hallow the halls of hell and bring everybody back to heaven in our own way, the way Jesus did, because he loved the Father. And there was no cross bigger. And I'll leave you with this. We have two choices in life. We can either keep the cross wooden and full of splinters so that we're afraid of it, or we can make the cross golden and make it a throne. But we can't lay them down. If we lay them down, we will never become what God intended us to be. Me too. You and me. Whatever cross we have, let's make it golden. 